Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second Life and Health Reimagined event here at Vic Health. And today it's good food, good food for all. It's great to have your company. I hope the technical stuff is working for you this week. I know we had a couple of issues last week, but we think it's just going to be smooth as silk today. And we've got a great panel for you as well. I'm Virginia Trioli from ABC Radio and ABC TV, and I'm delighted to be your host today. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting here in Carlton on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and pay my respects, our respects, to Elders past, present and emerging. In a moment, I'll explain what we're here to talk about today. But first of all, I'd like to introduce Kirsten Corbin, who's the Executive Manager of Programs here at VicHealth, just to welcome you all here today. Here's Kirsten. Hey everyone. Welcome to the second session of our Life and Health Reimagined series. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're based. Today, I'm in Mordialik. That's the home of the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. My name's Kirsten, and I love my job at VicHealth. One of my favorite things are the conversations we have with our communities and our stakeholders to help make life even better. Especially when those conversations focus on equity, and supporting those people who have fewer opportunities to achieve health. It's fantastic that we got off to such a great start with last week's session focusing on future work. I'm really excited around today's topic, good food for all and how do we get there? Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Kirsten. So that is our topic today, good food for all. And the purpose of these events is to inspire thought and action to make positive changes in communities across Victoria off the back of the opportunities, the, the silver linings that might come out of the COVID-19 situation. Coronavirus is testing the limits of Australia's food system, the complex web of supply chains that brings food from farm ultimately to fork. On the surface, our food system appears to have performed well. Though, if we look a little deeper and the cracks in our food system become clear, from struggling farmers right up to the chain to people experiencing food insecurity. This week, we look at the opportunities to strengthen the chain and to fix the cracks in between. We'll start with a really terrific presentation from our key guest today, who is Dr. Rachel Carey, lecturer in food systems at the Faculty of Vet and Agricultural Sciences at the University of Melbourne. After that, we're going to dive straight into a discussion with our terrific panel and I'll introduce them a little later. Now, remember, like last time, please po post your questions, your observations and vote your favourite questions up on Slido. If you log in to Slido online and our code again, what's our code again, Adam? Health Reimagined All, re Health re -imagined all uh, Lowercase. That gets you in and you can then... Uh, type in your questions and other people can vote them up as well. I'd also like to welcome back the fabulous Jessamy from Think in Colour. And Jessamy will be capturing today's discussion in live illustration, which will be available to you after the event. And the recording of today, today's event, for those you might know who miss out seeing it live, will be made available on the Life and Health Reimagined webpage. And finally, if you'd like to multitask, then please tweet about our event, get on your, facial, uh, your favorite social media platform. You can join the conversation using the hashtag, hashtag health reimagined. Dr. Rachel Carey, as I mentioned, uh, is our special guest today. Let's uh, hear her presentation, giving us a bit of an overview of what we're looking at today. Hello, I'm Rachel Carey from the School of Agriculture and Food at the University of Melbourne. On behalf of my co-authors, Kirsten Larson from the Open Food Network, and Jodie Clark from Right for Change, I'm going to give an overview of our paper, Good Food for All. COVID-19 has been a shock to many aspects of our lives, including the food system, the complex web of food supply chains that brings food from farm to fork. Many of us will have noticed signs of this shock early in the pandemic, when increased consumer demand for food led to empty supermarket shelves. With supply settled down now, there's plenty of food on the supermarket shelves, and at one level, our food system seems to have performed well. But if we look beneath the surface, COVID-19 has revealed that we need to pay attention to the cracks if we want our food system to be more resilient to future shocks. And it's important that we consider these issues now because COVID-19 presents us with an opportunity to create a better food system. New initiatives are emerging in response to this crisis that aim to ensure that everyone has access to enough fresh, healthy food, that food is grown in sustainable ways 
and that farmers are paid fairly for the food that they produce. We need to learn from what's working in these new initiatives. So firstly, what's COVID-19 telling us about our food system? COVID-19 shines a spotlight on the inequities in our food system. Australia is often described as being food secure because we produce a lot of food, but around 4% of Australians run out of food and can't afford to buy more. That's around a million people in one of the richest countries in the world, and that number is rising because of the growing economic crisis. In some population groups, people who are unemployed, lone parent households and households of incomes of less than $40,000 a year, over 10% of people run out of food and can't afford to buy more. And many more still skip meals or worry about running out of food. And almost 20% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are food insecure. The COVID-19 crisis has highlighted the weaknesses in our existing system of food relief, which relies on food rescue organisations and charitable groups. These groups do amazing work, but the system isn't set up to deal with a large increase in food insecurity during an economic crisis. It's a band-aid solution to a complex problem that mainly has its roots in poverty. We should focus instead on addressing poverty by promoting full employment, raising levels of income support to meet the cost of a healthy diet, and widening the welfare safety net to catch people who currently fall through the cracks. We also need to make sure that all the people who work in the food system are treated and paid fairly, including farmers. Secondly, COVID-19 highlights some of the vulnerabilities in our food supply chains. We produce a lot of food in Australia, but we rely on imports for some processed foods and for some critical inputs to the food system, like fertilizers, farm chemicals, and some types of additives and food packaging. Some of these imports have been delayed during COVID-19 because of border closures and disruption to transport systems. But COVID-19 has also revealed strengths in our food system. Farmers, retailers, and grassroots groups have developed innovative responses that could point the way to a more resilient food system that can better withstand and recover from future shocks. In Victoria, around 20 social enterprises came together early in the pandemic to form Moving Feast, a collective that provides meals to vulnerable Victorians, boxes of produce from local farmers and backyard growing kits. So far, they've delivered around 50,000 meals and 20,000 fresh food boxes. Farmers and farmers markets are connecting directly with consumers online to overcome the social distancing restrictions using platforms like the Open Food Network. Consumer interest is also growing in buying locally produced food. People seem to be cooking more at home, which could have a positive impact on our health because more frequent home cooking is associated with a healthier diet. And people are also interested in growing more of their own food at home. So do some of these changes sow the seeds for a more resilient food system that might help us to feed ourselves better? And what might a more resilient food system look like? One key feature is likely to be diversity. Diversity in the places that we source our food from, both locally produced and food from regional and global sources. Diversity in the scale at which food is produced, small scale as well as large scale, in who produces food, community as well as commercial production, and in the types of foods that we eat so that we eat a diverse range of fresh, healthy foods rather than relying on just a small number of crops. COVID-19 is an opportunity to reset our food system, but to do that, we'll need a wider policy lens. Food and agriculture policy in Australia focuses mainly on how we can increase our food exports and doesn't have enough to say about how we should feed ourselves. COVID-19 is an opportunity to focus on how we can deliver fresh, locally produced food to people in a way that is fair and that supports healthy and sustainable diets. To do that, we'll need a whole range of policy measures, including measures to permanently protect farmland around Australia's cities, to nurture a new generation of young farmers, and to encourage regenerative approaches to agriculture. A food system that's fit for purpose in the 21st century must do more than keep food on supermarket shelves. We'll be food secure in Australia when all Australians have access to a healthy diet when farm gate prices support farmer livelihoods, when we produce food in ways that regenerate rather than deplete natural ecosystems, and when the food system is resilient enough to withstand the shocks and stresses that we know are likely in the future, as well as those that we haven't yet anticipated. Dr. Rachel Carey there. Now let me introduce the panel of which Rachel is a member and we can bring them all up on the screen now. So first of all, Dr. Rachel Carey, who is speaking to you, she's gonna wave hello so you know which one she is. A lecturer in food systems at the Faculty of Vet and Agricultural Sciences at the University of Melbourne. Lisa Brassington is with us as well from Cardinia Food Circles. Lisa, did you do a wave? There we go. There's Lisa. 
uh, and Lisa is the Collective Impact Facilitator with the Cardinia Food Circles Project, working with government, industry and community to grow a healthy, delicious, sustainable and fair local food movement. Dr Nick Rose is with us as well. Nick, can you wave hello? There's Nick Rose. He's been the Executive Director of Sustain since its establishment in January 2016. He has a background in law and community development and Nick brings more than a decade of working at the grassroots and institutional levels in several Australian states in food sovereignty and sustainable food systems. Russell Shields is with us as well. Big wave from you, Russell. There, that's him. Founder and Chair of the Community Grocer, Russell's a food system specialist with a strong community engagement and project management background and a focus on food access and innovative enterprise development. And finally, Fihat Firdus. There's Fihat in the corner. Give us a wave, Fihat. Yes, I, I know it has to be you, but we're going to do it anyway. Um, a skilled migrant from Pakistan, currently working as a multicultural strategic engagement coordinator for Gippsland and working collaboratively with local services to create opportunities and appropriate service responses for improved settlement outcomes. She's a board member of West Gippsland Healthcare Group and a committee member of the Warrigal Community House. Welcome to all of our panel and uh, great to have everyone involved. Don't forget to use Slido to send in your questions. Um, so we, Rachel's presentation there highlighted a, a number of key issues for us to think about in relation to our food systems and how food gets from farm to us. Equity is a strong one that resonates now and of course equity has been a strong theme through these first months of COVID-19. So to begin with, let's talk about food insecurity. And um, Rachel, um, great presentation. Hello, nice to have you here. Okay. The only person sitting with me here today. <laughs> um, how big an issue is food insecurity and what effect has COVID-19 had on food insecurity? Yeah, it's a good question, Virginia. So look, it's a really big issue. In normal times, around 4% of Australians uh, run out of food and can't afford to buy more. So that's around a million people, which I think is absolutely shocking, yeah. um, given we're one of the richest countries in the the world. Now in some population groups that rate's much higher. So if we look at people who are unemployed, households on low incomes of less than $40,000, um, lone parent households, yeah. then you know they've experienced that at much higher rates. Now COVID-19 of course has really increased that. So we've got an economic crisis and we have higher rates of unemployment. What that means is that more Australians are unable to afford to buy sufficient healthy food and many more people still um, do things like skip meals in order to avoid being in that situation and worry about running out of food. So it's a very big problem under normal times, but it's getting worse now under COVID-19. Interesting, and I saw actually on a news item on ABC TV last night that and we're always reaching for silver linings in the uh, discussions that we're having here, that COVID-19 and at least the extended job seeker payment has meant for the first time for one family that the ABC looked at, they didn't have to skip a meal. They actually had the money now in the household, a single parent household, just as you say, mm. to afford now to have breakfast, lunch and dinner. And that's a really interesting point. Um, and although we know that generally speaking, more people are, are unable to afford to buy enough healthy food, we also know that some food relief organisations are actually reporting um, in some areas that they have lower demand at the moment because those income support payments are actually higher. But there's many food relief organisations throughout the state that are extremely worried about what's going to happen later in the year when those payments go down again. Yeah. So I guess that's telling us something perhaps about the level of income support that's required for people to be able to afford a healthy diet. Fihat, I want to turn to you if I can and just uh, keep that conversation going about food insecurity. What's that experience been like for community members that, that you work with and for? Um, so I guess within the multicultural community, there are various categories. So there are people who are maybe citizens, permanent residents, and then so, you know, on uh, multiple visa categories, temporary visa, um, protection visa holders. And I think every group has got a different sort of um, presentation of the issues. So I know from one example within our local area uh, in Gippsland, we've got a university campus, which has got 120 international students who are uh, really in the need of um, food assistance. Um, and the university is responding to that and the local organizations are, are attempting to respond to that. But I think it's really specific to the, air, um, to the target group that we're talking about. There's another group which is not eligible for the the, um, the support um, uh, packages um, or any of the stimulation packages, people who are on temporary protection visa, and they, they um, 
uh, experience of this COVID-19 and the food security is totally different. Um, there's another issue around, you know, the access to the culturally relevant food or um, some of the, you know, specific diet requirements, um, which uh, adds to the complexity. So people who have been living in um, various um, shires of Gippsland, um, we don't have local grocery shops that would cater to their needs, which means they go back to Melbourne um, and get their supplies. And sometimes it's difficult, especially in the beginning when we had a lot of fear around the big fines um, if you are found outside of your area. Um, so th th there have been quite a lot of, uh, I think, concerns around that. And uh, Russell Shields, can I get your reflection on that as well? I want to speak to you a little later in the conversation because uh, Rachel made reference of moving feast and I know you have a connection to that. But in the initial months and up until now, the issue of, of food insecurity, what's been your experience of that in the work that you do? Yeah, well, our, the community grocery markets are located predominantly on public housing estates. And what we found in initial periods when there was sort of the, the mass panic buying and people were rushing around hitting the supermarkets or fearfully leaving their properties, our localised market actually became a lot busier. So people weren't travelling as far as they would normally travel to access their food. Oh, my life's just gone off. Um, putting on a light show there for everybody while we're going. Um, <laughs> I thought it was so us. What, <laughs> so what we found was that the localised solution was actually um, really important that people could access our fruit and veg very close to their doorstep. The other thing that really was predominant was the pricing. So our prices are across the board about 60% cheaper than any other local fruit and vegetable outlet, including the major retailers through our community pricing model. We have a transparent pricing. We're about people, we're about produce, we're not about profit or shareholder value, as they would say. So when people were turning up to shop, they were really, we were noticing, they were trying to stretch that dollar as far as they could. So uncertain times were bringing people buying more food and where we could provide it, a lot more of those fresh veggies in the bulk supplies. Lisa Brassington, I'll turn to you and, and try and get perspective if I can of from, from your position in the Cardinia Food Circles Collective Impact Project. Food insecurity and your reflections on the conversation where we are so far? Definitely um, we've got parts of what was previously mentioned, but what we also got is with this Russian trend to go into fresh produce, people were so excited to try and find fresh produce. They'd get that fresh produce home and then stare at each other either side of the kitchen bench and go, we've got it, now what do we do with it? So we've had a really big rush on people wanting to know easy to use recipes, people watching our online uh, home cooking videos, that sort of thing. But people are starting to reconnect and discuss what is this food and then understand the seasonality of it. But from a hardship point of view, we've certainly got uh, people in our shire. I think we've got 87 different nationalities in our shire and certainly the cultural needs of seasonality of fresh produce and others and having to go into places like Danny Nong Footscray to address those has been an issue for us. And it's just highlighted that we're producing food in Cardinia, but that food is getting sold at farmers markets and at Elfington and in a city suburb. So we're kind of in a sort of a food desert donut in the fact that we can see it getting grown, but it's driving straight past us to be sold at other areas. So we're kind of in a strange space at the moment that we really do need to address that gap. That's very interesting. Before I move on to, to Nick Rose, tell us a little bit more about your project and, and what you do there. Okay, so the um, Cardinia Food Circles Collective Impact Project. Cardinia Shire was brave to realise that we needed to address our food system from a health perspective, not just from an economic agricultural perspective. So council said, how can we do that? And we didn't want to be a council driven initiative. We wanted to say to the community, what do you need? How can we address your health gaps or your food gaps. So in 2016, we got together some community facilitators and we had things called kitchen table talks where we went all around the Shire and everyone got together and said what they needed and what we've ended up developing out of that. And we re released last year as a community food strategy that is within the health and uh, wellbeing plan, which is in the council plan, mm. which means all, a lot of the business, government and community decisions in the Shire come from the community and are driven by the community so that we can have community outcomes where we address people's health in the agricultural and food system. And we've got lots of goals and we've got lots of uh, opportunities, issues and solutions. And um, right. we just right. need resources and income. <laughs> <laughs> 
you and everyone else. Uh, Nick Rose, can, can I turn to you just in this first part of our, our conversation talking about uh, food insecurity and in particular in relation to uh, sustain and the work that you do? Uh, yes, thanks uh, Virginia and, and great to be with you all this afternoon. I, I just a, a couple of quick reflections. Um, we have of course have been working with Cardinia Shire Council on that Food Circles project that Lisa was just talking about since uh, November 2016. And I think one of the first things I'd like to say is that the COVID-19 situation has really, as Rachel pointed out, revealed uh, vulnerabilities and fragilities and inequities in the food system that have been there for a long, long time. It's just that now they're sort of like more in the public consciousness and, and media and news are, are paying attention and talking about them because we've had panic buying in supermarkets and those kinds of things. But this is, you know, these things are not new. These pressures have been building for a very long time. Food insecurity is an entrenched problem in Australia and has been building for a great many years. Um, in the context of Cardinia, you know, for example, uh, Deakin University research has documented that uh, Pakenham is what they call a food swamp. Uh, one aspect of, of food insecurity is uh, the burden of chronic disease in Australia and, and people, particularly in lower socioeconomic suburbs such as Pakenham, uh, being faced with a food environment where for every healthy food outlet that they have, they have to drive past nine unhealthy food outlets. Um, in Tasmania, um, the Institute for Social Change at the Uni of Tas uh, a couple of weeks ago came out with some research that found that over a thousand, has, serving a thousand Tasmanians, one in four reported running out of food because they couldn't afford to buy more during the pandemic. Um, now that was differentiated according to those receiving job keeper payments. Mm. Uh, uh, who were, um, sorry, the job seeker payment recipients were reporting double the level of food insecurity than the job keeper payment. So one in two are recipients of job keeper payment, job seeker payments rather. And we know that these reforms are being wound back by the federal government. So um, while we're talking about what's been happening over the last couple of months and what's happening right now, let's bear in mind that the federal government is um, hell bent on winding back the reforms and the assistance that's been put in place. Uh, we know that there's an economic contraction coming uh, so we're going to see, I think, these, you know, th these, these inequities really accelerate and become entrenched uh, and a much greater problem uh, from September onwards. Rachel, you're talking in your, um, in your piece about uh, a, a local response and a sort of a, a localised... I've heard, heard a few good examples of it there mm -hmm. uh, in relation to the, the, the early challenge of COVID-19 and the cracks that appeared in the food system. Talk to me a little bit more about that because the, a, a local response, of course, ultimately, and, and if, if we continue down this track and in a very positive sense about what that might mean for access to food, to locally grown, healthy, fresh food and the like, a local response will have a systemic consequence, of course, for the whole system of fo food growing and the more kind of industrial way that we have chosen to grow food. Talk to me a little bit about that mm. because I don't know if our farming and growing system is ready to change in that way. Right. Well, look, I think if we, well, one thing's really to think about, of course, at the moment is how can we make sure that our food system is more resilient mm -hmm. in future and, the, and to be able to uh, withstand and bounce back from various shocks and stresses. And we know that it's going to face more shocks and stresses in the future um, due to climate change, of course. Yeah as well as other types of things. So what does a more resilient food system look like? And I think one of the key features there is that that system needs to be more diverse than it is currently. And what do you mean so, by diverse? So by more diverse, diverse in different ways. So for instance, diverse in the places that we source food from. So our food system is quite optimised at the moment to be um, sourcing nationally, to be sourcing globally. It's not very well optimised, as Lisa was saying, to source locally. Yeah. So we need to strengthen those, those local food supply chains, those direct connections between farmers and consumers and businesses as well. More diverse in the types of enterprises that we're buying our food from. Um, more diverse in the scale at which we're growing food. So we tend to focus here at the moment in this country on large scale export oriented food that's production. Right, yeah. That's what the we're industrial saying, reference I was making. That's yes. right, that's right. And look, what we're saying here is that it's about thinking about food growing at multiple different scales. Small scale is also important. Small scale can be uh, flexible, it can be adaptive. And we saw that in the Queensland floods as an example. So in the Queensland floods, when Brisbane was cut off 2010-11, and what happened was that the major food supply routes down the east coast were actually cut off. Mm. It was some of those smaller scale farmers and some of those um, box schemes that were already in place, but were able to flexibly navigate their way around the system and get food to people at critical times. So it's not necessarily that we're saying it's about one or the other. It's really about saying that in a diverse system, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. Yep. In a diverse system, it's important to look at multiple sources, types of enterprises and communities 
opportunity as well as commercial growing as well. But, but one eats into the other, I guess I'm, I'm suggesting there as well. I mean, from the, in, in, in that local response. And, and again, maybe we can get a general reflection from the panel about the, um, the willingness of the, the, the system itself to, to change in that way and for large scale growers to either relinquish market or for smaller scale growers to move into that? Rachel, first well, I of think all. I think that we are seeing we are seeing some changes. I think that um, one of the things we're seeing through COVID-19, for instance, is this increasing demand for locally produced food. Yeah. So we're seeing um, big big increases in orders and demand for local vegetable box schemes, for instance. And so we are seeing farmers respond to that. Some of those farmers that lost their markets that were perhaps selling for food service and hospitality sectors had to pivot, and some of those have pivoted more towards local food supply chains. We've seen lots of farmers going online as well into mm. platforms like the Open Food Network where they're able to more effectively connect directly to consumers and to other local businesses. So I think that we are seeing some changes. It's not here about saying local versus global or regional. It's about saying local has a place alongside regional, alongside global as well, and more resilient food system. I want to come back and talk about where we grow and some of the work that, um, that you and your colleagues have been doing for a number of years now on how we've been losing that growing belt mm. around Melbourne and the consequence for the food system here. But can I turn to the panel and um, wake up your hand if you've got something, just if I can see everyone, if you want to wake up your hand if you've got a particular burning point that you want to make, just having heard from Rachel. Uh, yes, go right ahead, Nick. Yeah, look, I think um, it's important to uh, make the point that when we're talking about resilience and sustainability and equity in the food system, we also need to talk about some fundamental principles. So human rights, I think, is a good one to talk about. There is something in international law called the Human Rights of Adequate Food to which all Australian governments are committed to achieve and have been since 1976. The fact that there's, as Rachel said, over a million Australians that are food insecure shows that governments are failing us and, and we're failing the most vulnerable in our society. The second thing to say is that um, in terms of getting these changes and making the food system more resilient and more sustainable, there are powerful vested interests that want to keep the system as it is. There's questions of power and concentration, both politically and economically, uh, that benefit uh, the powerful entities in the food system, both in Australia, uh, nationally and globally as well. I mean, the most obvious example is the supermarkets in the Australian yeah. system. Uh, which have disadvantaged farmers in rural and regional communities for decades, so much so that 100 years ago, Australian farmers were receiving 90 cents of every dollar's worth of food they produce today, it's about 10 to 15 cents. Um, you know, that, that translates into uh, levels of depression and suicide amongst Australian farmers that are double the national average, farmers ageing uh, in average 60 compared to the average Australian worker of 40, farmers not wanting to leave their, their farms to their children because they know it's very hard work and it's not rewarding. So these are fundamental structural um, uh, imbalances and inequities in the, in the, in the food system, uh, both nationally and globally, that need to be talked about and need to be addressed. Right? These, are, these are impediments to all the kinds of changes that Rachel is suggesting. If we don't address, address the concentrations of power, democratise the food system, get people more engaged with political actors, uh, seeing that this is important, uh, we won't get to the, the kind of food system that will be equitable and fair. Sure. Um, I, I think people can find that overwhelming, though, Nick, and that all of that and the idea of solving all of that almost seem impossible. I know that people are sort of here today in particular wanting to um, talk about even if they are small scale solutions or positive moves forward. So I think that that identifying that as, as the structural, you know, uh, structure around us in which we speak is really important. But let's try and concentrate, if we can, on what's achievable. And I, I, with that, I want to turn, to turn to Russell and get you to talk a little bit about Moving Feast, if you can, because I think it's an interesting example of a smaller scale uh, approach to dealing with what we're talking about here. Russell, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Virginia. And I think um, also when just reflecting on Rachel's and Nick's comments about the, the localisation and the sort of the, um, the positives of that, we see that at the grocer where uh, people shopping at the major retailers, you know, the choice of food that is there is they don't have the choice. They don't have the option of being able to say what they would like. Um, where at the grocery, these localised markets, these fresh produce markets that we run, our customers tell us what we want. And that way, in each of the public housing estates, we can localise the supply. So, for instance, you know, in our Flemington markets, where we'll have a lot of um, high um, Vietnamese communities, so we'll have lots of fresh Asian greens and the produce they like to cook with. In our Carlton grocer, where we have a lot of customers from the Horn of Africa, we have a lot more root vegetables and a lot more of the produce and the spices that they like to cook with. So they have the ability to help drive the produce that they're supplied. So that's um, certainly one of the benefits of a localised system. 
And with Moving Feast, I think that's a, a fantastic sort of study and insight into the way social enterprises can mobilise in these times. And what Beck Scott from Street has started and got together a collection of enterprise-based food businesses that are looking at both the supply end of food all the way through to the customer, to the feeding people in the most experiencing the most disadvantage. What social enterprise offer is that, again, their focus is not about making the profit. We're not scared of profit. We want to generate revenue and we trade, but we're about people. We're about the planet. You know, we're about purpose. So, and we're connected into the community. So the decisions that we make as a business, as a social enterprise, are driven by the community, by our customers, or by the planet we're trying to protect and save. So in these times, what we've seen is this moving feast um, come to the forefront as a real positive mobilisation of a collection of social enterprises, all focused on positive outcomes. Rachel, what we're all about is the initial problem, how do we address food insecurity right now, but also trying to address the stuff Nick talked about, the larger systemic problems with the food system. So what can we build now that over time will leave this great legacy for a better food system for all? Rachel, you wanted to jump in there? Sure. Um, I think that what Nick and Russell are both alluding to there really is what are the principles that underlie the food system? What, what is it for, right? What's the point of that system? Um, and I think they're pointing to some basic principles there. And so the thing that I would, you know, Nick earlier referred to the rights of food, and I think that's actually really important. I mean, surely one of the main purposes, if not the main purpose of the food system should be to feed everybody um, in, a, in a really equitable way to make sure that everyone has access to healthy food and food that's produced in a way that's positive for the environment as well. Now, if our food system isn't doing that, then what, what is it for, right? Uh, to me, I always say that the food system is failing if it's not able to do that. And I think the right to food is really important. So the right to food, is, as Nick was saying, is a fundamental human right. You know, Australia's um, signed up to that. But if we're letting a million people go hungry every year under normal times, then, then we're not we're not helping people to realise that right. And I think it's really important, um, and it's going to become more important during this economic crisis, that governments at all levels recognise that that right to an adequate diet is a fundamental human right, and their responsibility in helping people to realise that right. But do you think they are? I would say we're not doing that adequately at the moment. I would say that if... if I would you say know. it's not happening at all. Yeah, exactly, I mean, <laughs> exactly. Well, um, the, the, the reason uh, that I you know, said what I did in relation to Nick, and it was not to push back, it's just that... In my job in particular, <laughs> I confront on a daily basis the overwhelming structural nature of these problems. Mm. And it seems to me that a solution-based approach that may actually be you know, a microcosm or, or, or a localised actually is the only one that at a time like this gives you a sense of hope. Mm. All that stuff we know. It's always going to be there. We're, we're um, joint signatories to the you know, international rights on refugees. Would you like to spend half an hour talking about where we sit on that? Let's not. Because it, honestly, it just it drives you mad. And it'll, and it'll kind of get you nowhere. So, yeah. And uh, I guess I would just push back a bit, Virginia, and say that I think right it's, it's both. <laughs> I think it's both, right? I think that the yeah. community the community level um, initiatives that we're talking about are really important and doing absolutely, absolutely fantastic but, but, work. But government should be supporting those initiatives. And why is it left at the emergency food I'll, sector? I'll, Nick, I'll, I'll come back to, to you. I want to hear from Lisa. I'll come back to you, Nick. I want to hear from Lisa first. Um, yes, absolutely. But I don't think they're engaged in that. And I don't think the, the, the power of the supermarkets is, is going to be broken anytime soon. I think it is a local response that will chip away from the bottom up. It won't be from the top down. But I'll throw that out there as a provocation <laughs> to get everyone thinking. Uh, Lisa, do you want to jump in there? And Nick, I'll come to you. Yeah. I'd like to build on that. In my role, the concept that the food rescue expanding means my role in the food system is failing. Because if we have got a healthy, inclusive fair-minded food system, we should have a reduced and barely operational food rescue industry. So that's the first step. The second point, our large farmers are supported by industry groups, by their growers groups. Our small and medium farmers in peri-urban Melbourne are they're supported by the community grocer. So building on your ground, people actually understood what is grown in their backyard, metaphorically in their green wedge or their peri-urban area. 
they would want to seasonally enjoy that more and more. So it's even us getting the word out. It's, that's why people have potato festivals. That's why people have garlic festivals. It's the celebration of what their region supports and supplies. So that's one of the uh, scenarios that we're facing. People are having an awakening and people that didn't realise actually live in a food district, they live in a food system bowl, are currently now coming to us saying, how can we ensure those farmers remain viable and then we've got small and medium farmers coming to us saying we face on a weekly episode food uh, uncertainty we don't know should we harvest not to harvest should we have staff on because farmers markets are open farmers markets are closed yeah. so there's a lot of di dynamic uh, events happening on the small to medium the larger food systems are getting quite well supported on an industrial scale so that's what we're very aware of the fragility of what's happening one side of the farm gate versus the other and are our farmers facing food insecurity because I know who they are. Um, uh, Nick I will come to you but Fihat hasn't had a bit of a go for a while so let's hear from Fihat and then, then I'll come straight uh, to you Nick. I just quickly wanted to add in that that the backyard growers I think um, to, if you look at the demographics of Australian um, population we've got um, quite a big diverse um, background people like 21 percent of people who have been born um, overseas and I think they all bring their own um, farming practices it could be small um, uh, scale or it could be big scale I think that's an asset that hasn't been um, um, fully explored um, and utilised to to bring into the to the food system of Australia. So I know you know there is local food um, hub in where I live in Warrigal, um, but ha has it been able to develop those connections with our local Vietnamese or Chinese or Rohingya and Burmese um, people? That's something that I think is um, certainly can add a bit more communication around the assets that they bring, but also bringing them into the um, the you know the the system as well. Yeah. Nick, go ahead. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, so a couple of things. One is, uh, I, I, one of the reasons I love working in this space in food systems is because there's so many points of entry and there's so many ways in which people can get involved. And, and Fahad has just kind of mentioned backyard growing. Um, surveys have shown that uh, over half Australians are involved in raising or producing some of their own food. Sustain has a survey out right now, which has received over a thousand responses on pandemic gardening, which is actually documenting uh, what uh, all of us across the country have been doing during these last few months. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us have been spending time in the garden uh, and growing a lot of food, and it means a great deal to people. Uh, people have said that the pandemic has made them feel worried and anxious and stressed. Conversely, they've said um, the garden has got them through. Um, the garden has been extremely important uh, mentally, psychologically, and also in providing healthy and nutritious food. So that is happening. People are doing that, uh, and that's a wonderful thing to support. But I think the structural questions are important because if we don't understand the causes and the nature of the challenges that we're facing, uh, then our solutions are not going to be fit for the purpose and appropriate to the task that we face. And this is beyond the food system. This actually goes to the nature of our democracy and our democratic culture. And if we simply kind of throw our hands up and say, well, the politicians are all corrupt, the corporations are too powerful, they're too big, there's nothing we can do. Let's just kind of like focus on the micro and what we can do in our own you know, backyard and our own community. Um, yes, that will give us a sense of satisfaction and control over our own lives, but we effectively vacate the political space to powerful lobby groups and vested interests who are driving forward a very destructive and negative agenda. Um, and we see the, how that's playing out in the United States. It's absolutely catastrophic and disastrous, and people's lives are being sacrificed um, you know, on the altar of profit, on the altar of um, powerful political interests. We're, we're heading down that path in Australia. Australians are very um, cynical about our democratic institutions, from the media um, to both political parties um, and to our institutions yep. and with very good reason. We, we need to reclaim our democratic culture. That's the work we've been doing at Cardinia Shire Council. Lisa mentioned the kitchen table talks. That was a participatory food policy making process. And that's the opportunity from the local government working with communities right around Victoria nationally to debate these issues, to raise levels of food systems literacy, to understand the systemic uh, challenges and, and identify the priorities locally and the actions that people can take. Okay. And that let, can be a Nick, way let, of breathing life back into a democratic culture. Yeah, let, let me move on to some questions that are coming in online and also some questions I want to ask Rachel here. You mentioned before innovations, and let's get to a few of those and what are um, 
uh, are coming out so far and potentially that you see as innovations that might come out of this and if you can somehow refer to whether we as uh, as, as local growers and say just say stay with Victorians for a moment mm. as Victorian growers what positively you've seen coming out of out of that and our potential and ability through COVID-19? Mm, that's another interesting question. Um, look, I think uh, we've seen farmers really having to adapt to, to the current situation. People have faced a situation where they've lost their markets um, and potentially some people have had to actually plough those crops back in. They've had to look for other ways that they can um, sell that sell that produce. And I think that. Um, I said before, I know we're going to get back to talking about local again, but I think some of the really innovative responses that we've seen have been in that regard, where farmers have been looking again at how it is that they sell, how can they connect directly through to other consumers and other businesses. Now, that's really important because if you're able to sell direct as a farmer, then you've kind of cut out the middleman. If you it's like, a lot of work for you as a farmer. It is though. a lot of work for you as a farmer, and I think that's where we need it's to much have... much easier to load up the truck and just you're send it into Woolies. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So, I mean are we in that situation and asking farmers to grow the food and then to go and set up on a Saturday as well? That's a really important point. But what sort of platforms, what sort of infrastructure can we put in place for farmers so they're able to retain a greater share of the food dollar? Yeah. Because, of course, if the farm gate price is pushed below the point at which farmers can make a profit, then... It's pointless. Exactly. It's, we're all in trouble. And have the digital platforms been of use here? I think they have been of use. So, well, I think uh, clearly farmers are voting with their feet. I mean, yeah. so we've seen, um, as I said, platforms like the Open Food Network, then they've had a tenfold increase in mm -hmm. the number of farmers going online. They've had a 14-fold increase in the revenue through that platform as well. So we've seen various things like that happening where I think farmers are needing to change what they do and to adapt to the circumstances. But I do think that some of that kind of relocalizing of food supply chains, especially for those smaller scale farmers, can be of great benefit. Then there's, there's a lot that we could do to actually support that. So how can we leverage that? How can we build on that now? What would that be that we could do to support that? So there's a few different things there. One of the things is that we, do, we, need, we need more infrastructure, basically, to strengthen those local food supply chains, as Lisa was mentioning before. We need infrastructure like um, uh, smaller scale processing facilities where farmers can process that produce, smaller scale abattoirs, perhaps mobile abattoirs and processing facilities That's that are more appropriate. Enormously consolidated abattoirs. That's right, that are yeah. more appropriate for, for smaller scale production as well, that, so more farmers have access um, to them. We could also think about um, how is it that government could enable consumers and businesses to be supporting local Victorian farmers. Now, there's a few things there. One thing is making it easier for people to identify locally produced food. It's actually quite hard to work out yeah. what food has been grown in your state. So what kind of branding or labeling could we use so that consumers can identify locally produced food and buy it? Could government do things like decide to buy all food for government services, or at least a proportion of that food from local Victorian farmers? We could introduce standards for government food procurement, yep. so that all the food bought for hospitals, prisons, we schools have it for was other coming elements of government exactly yeah. was coming from local Victorian farmers. Wouldn't that be a great economic stimulus? Yep. Right now, there's all kinds of things that we could do, and I think that that interest from consumers is there now. COVID-19 has raised that. Let's build on that. I want to put some questions from our terrific audiences there coming in today and one that's been voted up quite high and I think it's really interesting in the context of the, the food insecurity and the issues that, that Nick and Fahat and Rachel you've been raising in particular about who's been going without. Um, Kate Wingrove really uh, bells the cat on this. How can we uncouple solutions to food insecurity from solutions to food waste? Food waste is an important issue, but access to food is a human right and people should not have to rely on food assistance. Our food wastage, of course, as many people know here, and Luke van der Beek, I'll mention as well, has asked a similar question. So much food insecurity and yet so much food waste. What more can be done to reduce food waste while ensuring that excess food gets to those who need it? Russell, can I come to you on that? And uh, if anyone else wants to particularly jump in there, just raise your hand and I'll come to you next. Russell? Yeah, thanks, Virginia. And I think their food waste and food access, food insecurity. But I also think it's really important we don't conflate the two issues. So often, and particularly in the food rescue and the food banking sector, that's the language I use. We've got all this waste. How do we use or address the food waste to then feed people in need? Mm -hmm. I think personally, we have to keep them separate because the challenges around food waste need solutions but just then using food that's donated, food that someone doesn't want, 
not valuing that food and throwing it out, then saying, okay, well, the people over here, that's how we're going to feed you. Yeah, yeah. That's not the right way. If we want to focus on food insecurity, using food that's being thrown out is not going to be the answer. And that's really yeah, that, shown up through that, COVID. That, that puts them in a, in a, in a, it puts food in such a hierarchical way that they are, they are downstream of the food, food system and can basically you know, take what they get. Absolutely. And what's happened in, in COVID times is we've seen that the food banking sector has absolutely struggled. I mean, people just want to help people with food. So they've got absolutely the right intention. Yeah. But when they're relying on the corporate food donations, they've dried up. Their volunteer base has dried up. When you know nine out of 10 staff in the emergency food relief sector are volunteers, well, not staff, they're volunteers. So um, all of the challenges in that system have really come to the surface during COVID. And it's proven that there's massive issues across the system we need to address. OK, so, 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 uh, so uncouple the two for me um, in, uh, and yeah. keep them separate as you would like. Uh, mm. it, are there questions there that need to be asked in your mind completely separately or is there any linkage between the two? Because even at that, at that um, sort of processed food or, um, or created food level, say, you know, in, at functions or whatever that's repurposed, there's still a great deal of food waste at the primary production level as well. Oh, absolutely. There's staggering amounts of uh, food waste across the food chain. Yeah. You can look at that, the intersections with that food chain and go, well, how do we address the waste here? What we're doing is we're deflecting the challenges around waste by allowing food corporations to say, well, look, we donate, so that's, that's our bit about addressing food waste. Mm. Well, let's talk about the specifications you put on farmers and the rejection rates you're pushing onto farmers for food that's perfectly fine to eat. There's nothing wrong with the food, but they're saying it doesn't look right. So that's the corporation making that decision that's pushing all this food waste into the, into the planet, into the, into the landfill. So that's something that can't be solved just by saying, well, we're going to donate it to a charity. Yeah. That's their way out of dealing with their choice to increase food waste. Does anyone else have a response to that question that's come in online in relation to uh, food insecurity and food waste? Uh, Nick, yes, go ahead. Yeah, just, just quickly, um, I mean, I'd come back to the matter of principle, and I'm glad Rachel kind of like re-emphasised that. I mean, if we're talking about this from basic fundamental rights and human rights to adequate food, it's a matter of human dignity that people are not fed uh, second grade, um, you know, past sell-by date uh, food waste. Uh, it, it's a very problematic discourse that's become very normalised in Australia and Britain and America and most other, you know, rich developed countries that there, we've got a kind of like a sector that says, you know, aren't we great because we're saving food waste from landfill and we're feeding hungry people. We're kill, killing two birds. OK, well, what's stone. the solution? I would say that's, that's, that's not great. That's, that's really problematic. The solu well, solution is to um, have a, as a matter of principle that we're committed to dignified access to food. So that comes back to Rachel's point about um, actually empowering people with financial resources to access food in a dignified way. Um, and there's lots of elements to that. And the second one is, um, from the food bank perspective, I would look to the model in Canada, Community Food Centres Canada, uh, which is a totally reimagined. We're talking about reimagining food and life and health here. A reimagined concept of the food bank um, and, and transforming uh, the, 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 the vulnerable people, the food insecure people who are accessing food banks. Um, from feeling humiliated and undignified and accessing food this way to feeling empowered um, and supported to take back control over their own lives in a very dignified context and setting. And that's what community food centres mm. have done, and I think it's a fantastic model. Nick, I'm glad you raised the issue of, of dignity because there's a question that comes coming in I want to get to about the concept of shame, which I actually think is really important here too. But, Fihad, I, I want to come to you because um, I know locally where you are, the Food Security Network came uh, together to deliver a workshop for local providers to understand how they could provide relief there. And I just thought this was an interesting experience that you could share with us in the context of where we are in the conversation. Yeah, so within the COVID-19, and, and um, few people mentioned that, you know, it has brought few opportunities as well, um, but it has um, some of the vulnerabilities that were hidden in the community. So our local food bank didn't have previously experienced a lot of people from culturally diverse background accessing their service, but within the COVID-19, they started receiving people from diverse background, which raised a concern that with the prepackaged food parcels, um, you know, are their needs being met? Are they being, um, you know, uh, provided relief with dignity and respect? And uh, uh, are they being able to cook what they 
um, usually eat on a day-to-day basis. Um, based on that sort of, um, uh, you know, feedback, we tried just seeking some information that what's available in the community that could fulfil the needs of the uh, culturally diverse people um, and developed a bit of list of, for people to know where they can order some grocery maybe online, but also brought um, someone from Melbourne from Halal Food Bank to deliver a culturally relevant food parcel yeah. uh, information session locally just to help that um, start that conversation and think about, you know, why do we need to think about what are some of the specific needs? And I guess previously it hasn't been an issue because people could come and pick what they need. But now with the prepackaged food parcel, it has raised concerns about whether people's meet, um, needs are being met or not. I've got a question here from Tracy McCaffrey who asks, um, and it's been voted right to the top, does there appear to be a change in the sentiment around food insecurity, particularly in the media and social media? Before COVID, it was perhaps one of shame and embarrassment, and now it's affecting more people. Is it less shame-based? And with that, I'll, I'll just share just briefly a little moment that I had on my radio program, which was a real you know, ringing bell moment where uh, we were all talking about the restrictions being loosened up and now we can all finally go to a cafe and meet a friend for a latte or have lunch or whatever. And I got a text message in that said, um, I've loved COVID-19 for the first time ever. I haven't had to be embarrassed and keep making excuses for why I can't afford to go out and meet my friends for lunch or meet, take the friend, kids out for dinner or meet people for a coffee. And it was just this smack about the face of, you know, wake up. It's exactly your point, Rachel, about the, the constant life of food insecurity that many people live in. So around that issue of shame, uh, Lisa, I'm wondering if you'd like to start on that first and then anyone else who'd like to uh, have an attempt at answering, answering Tracy, Tracy's question would be great. Just wake up your hand. Lisa? Uh, the relief and food rescue groups we've got out in our shire have said they haven't had their regular clients come through. There have been a new wave of clients, people that have never entered into the space of having to understand where or how can I access food that feeds a family. So at the moment, because everybody has experienced some uncertainty during COVID, the shame is a little bit more, it's okay, we're all right, we're part of a collective experiencing something new. It's when we'll be post job keeper, post job seeker, etc. Mm. when you will have some people that go back into the workforce and others that don't, when the actual movement of shame will become a point where people will choose not to go to receive or ask for food because of shame, not because of the lack of nutrition. And we find that with farmers as well. When you've got farmers in drought, bushfire, etc., and currently at the moment you've got farmers in economic drought because they can't get food to market, they're not coming up to us saying, look, I am your local lettuce grower, but I've got to tell you, I can't feed my family. So we've got a dichotomy of someone who's trying to produce food but not feeding their family. And I just wanted to pick up earlier on the waste topic, food waste, it, a farmer doesn't grow produce to have it thrown away or to not be consumed. Mm. Their love and passion goes into that caring of food production, livestock, horticulture. So you have multi-layers. You have farm waste. You have supermarket waste. You have kitchen waste. You have prepared food waste. And then you have other out of uh, used by waste. So it's actually a multifaceted way of literacy. We're getting a lot of kitchen waste because people are trying to go down the fresh produce for nutrition level, but not understanding simply how to prepare food. Mm. So the waste pitch is actually a little bit bigger, a little bit more complex. And we've had the silver lining of COVID that's brought that conversation to the table. So we can actually work with everyone that is suffering some impact on that level of waste to make sure we can repair a food system where food is not wasted. Did you want to jump in there as well and say something? Uh, look, I think that the question of um, shame, the important thing here is how do people feel? How are the people who are accessing those services actually feeling? How are they experiencing it? And I would hope that we get to the point in the future where they don't actually need to be accessing a food bank. They don't need to be asking for emergency food relief. Um, so it's not shame based from that point of view because we've actually increased the income support levels to the point where they don't need to do that and where we've gathered more people into that welfare safety net. In your presentation towards the end, you were talking about uh, consequences for the, the, the growing that we have on the city perimeter and perhaps mm. also encouraging a next and newer generation of farmers uh, into the system as well. 
it's always been really heartening to me to see uh, the, the, the generations below me are, are far more entrepreneurial than, than my Gen X generation ever was. Um, and they, they set up their own you know, shops and their own retail railers and they, they get into to growing in a way that I wasn't brave enough to do. Do you see any um, signs of hope there? Well, yeah, absolutely, in the sense that there are amazing new young farmers coming through doing mm. farming in very innovative ways, farming in very sustainable ways. And they're not looking to become sort of, you know, large-scale farmers, are they? They're perfectly happy with the idea of a smaller market and um, unfettered growth isn't necessarily, you know, the, uh, the business model that they're looking at. That's right, absolutely. And I think that they derive um, a, lot of, a lot of pleasure from that direct connection that they have to the consumer, to the mm. business that's actually going to use that food and that values that food. Um, so I think that there are many farmers coming through, for instance, who would like to be farming. We talked about Melbourne farming in Melbourne's food bowl area. And of course, if we want to have a more resilient food system into the future that can withstand those shocks and stresses, we're going to need to keep that land base, the farmland on that fringe. stop putting houses on that land. That's right. Stop putting houses on that land. We need it. Yeah. We need it to be growing food for the future. So yeah. we need to sort out those policy frameworks as well in order to prevent yeah. that. There's been a lot of you know, pushback around that and I think a bit of shifting, but not nearly as much mm. as we want to see. We're coming to the end of our discussion. So could we quickly go around the panel? I just mentioned to, to Rachel there the, the, um, the signs of hope that she's seen. Can we end on that note, anything coming out of COVID-19 in relation to this issue of food security and signs of hope that, that you may have seen. Um, I, I might start with you if I can, Russell. Thanks, Virginia. Yeah, I think you know, food is well, it's such a powerful tool to create really positive social and environmental change. And I think when we talk about reimagining, we have over 40 years of evidence around the globe showing that food banking and food relief is not the answer. It's not the positive. What we do at the grocer is we try to reimagine that. How do we provide healthy food? How do people have dignity, choice, nutrition, and access to real high quality fruit and veg on their local doorstep? So the great models out there, social enterprise is absolutely one of the ways that we're going to get through both this crisis yeah. and the future. And for those that I just want to also acknowledge those that are unable to you know, I'm lucky, I breakfast, I lunch and I can sit in front of a laptop today and talk to this amazing community out there and hopefully be some type of representative for those that are really struggling with access to food. So we've got to work all this together. Our words and our wallet are the two most powerful things that we can use to change the food system, mm -hmm. where we buy our food and the questions we ask about where our food comes from. Fiat, can I come to you next? Uh, I think that within the COVID-19, what I found very um, promising is that the opening of those conversation, we are being able to focus, zoom in on some of the issues like food security or, um, you know, what's happening in the community, how people are being treated uh, based on their skin colours. I think we have been really able to zoom in and look at what are some of the solutions. So I think I'm hoping that this collaborative space and collaborative approach will continue even after the COVID-19, whatever our new normal would be, but we would be able to take advantage of this collaboration. Nick, I'll come to you next. Thanks, Virginia. I'm an optimist by nature, and I think the COVID situation has really uh, been a, a moment of, of disruption that's really created opportunities for, for all kinds of really positive conversations and reflection. Uh, in our pandemic gardening survey, uh, we asked, would you agree or disagree with this statement? The pandemic has created possibilities for a better, fairer, and more sustainable society. I feel hopeful about the future. 25% uh, of, of a thousand people have strongly agreed with that. 29% agree, and a further 28 somewhat agree. So 90% of respondents agree with that statement, agree with that sentiment that there is there are opportunities. But uh, a lot of them in comments have said they're seeing a return to business as usual. They're seeing the government rush back to the business mm. as usual policy. So their their hope about the future is being really mitigated by what they're seeing a response to the government. Which comes back to my point about us needing to engage in the process use this opportunity to articulate and cohere around a positive um, vision for uh, our food system, for our health and for our society. The opportunity is there. We've got glimpses of it during the pandemic, but it's up to us to actually make the future that we want. Lisa. Uh, two big shines for me is that cultural diversity and cultural food needs are being openly discussed and openly valued, that we are such a multicultural round table of consumption in Victoria, that we need to understand that perhaps we can have a boom in small to medium farmers that grow culturally specific 
crops and livestock needs, etc. And then um, the flip side of that, I think the valuing of local food and fresh produce and the fear of not having access to it has escalated the respect of farmers that are farming and how can we retain and help those farmers continue to farm and use that information that Rachel's team has put together in Foodprint in areas like mine in Cardinia Shire, but greater, greater Melbourne and in Victoria, anyone, any farmers outside of large cities are all peri-urban farmers. They don't have to be farmers outside mm -hmm. of Melbourne, but there is a re-respect that soil is infinite, uh, not his <laughs> soil is finite. We can't grow food with concrete. We need the soil. So what has been amazing that's come out of this time is people are talking about what we cannot lose and what we need to live with. And the COVID-19 nutrition uh, recovery is a food-led and a food system-led mm. recovery. Yep. And that's been one of the, uh, the, probably the only good thing about this whole thing is that it's pointed out to us how we actually would want to live and that it seems... Mm. Uh, closer and within more within our grasp than they even thought the way that we would prefer to live. Um, thank you all. It's been a terrific conversation and um, you know, really bold and, and really interesting. So please thank our panellists. If you're watching us at home or at work at the moment, Rachel and Lisa and Nick and Russell and Fahat, thank you very much. Next week's panel, our reimagined event, is being held on Thursday the, tw uh, the 2nd of July at 2 p.m. It'll be hosted by Shelley Ware and the topic is urban planning and health. And uh, boy, is there a strong uh, connection between the two of those. Vic Health is also partnering with the Cancer Council, Victoria's Achievement Program for a webinar on Monday 29th of June about prevention in Victoria post COVID-19. All the details can be found on Cancer Council Victoria's website or the Vic Health social media pages. Uh, it's been great having your company. Thanks for all of your terrific questions today. And please join Shelley next week for the next Vic Health Reimagined event and um, I'll see you soon. Thanks. Good afternoon.